the times <laughs> I get told this is a once in a hundred year event, I go, well, I've done dot com, SARS. Yep. I've done nine eleven. Yeah. I've done the GFC, COVID. COVID. <laughs> And there'll Actually, be something else. There's a few other. Yeah. Asia, there was an Asian financial crisis course, in Eastern yeah. Europe. So, so almost there is always a crisis yeah. somewhere going on. It may not affect your business, but it's going to be affecting somebody. So, good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today, I'm joined in studio by Ralph Shale, who is a business growth advisor, particularly focused on high growth businesses. So, welcome to the studio. Thanks very much. Oh, it's really good to have you here. So we've met, I actually can't remember how we met, but we met sort of through, I think, mutual acquaintances and we had a bit of a chat and we share similar philosophies on on the way business should be run and, and certainly around yeah, creating freedom, doing what you love, et cetera, et cetera. So why don't you just tell the listeners a little bit about, about you and where you've come from? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a long story, which I'll keep short. <laughs> um, probably following about 15 odd years in traditional corporate environments, both um within banking and uh, on corporate side, I got involved in 2000 with uh, some friends and we established a business that was looking to help early stage companies raise capital and commercialize. So the last 22 years has been working with a whole range of New Zealand companies and whether that's raising capital, whether it's helping them with strategic partnerships, um, we've done some sort of management buyouts and those sorts of things. So very much in the sort of small um smaller businesses early stage businesses and it's just an area that i'm really fascinated with and really enjoy so excellent um, so can you give us some examples of, of clients that you've worked with yeah look over the over that time i mean i, I was talking to somebody yesterday uh, the other week about sort of the success of the new zealand gaming industry and i recall that in the early days um you know wetter workshop was around and starting there was a whole lot of um companies spinning out of you know, the the Lord of the Rings work and creating new technology. So I go back then, um, early advisor to Rocket Lab. Um, oh, cool. Mainly prior to, prior to Peter actually getting some decent funding. Um, but yes, very early stage um, advisor there. Um, I've got clients that I've worked with for, you know, eight or nine years that are now finally starting to get the right sort of traction. Um, you know, product market fit and stuff like that. So, so there'll be more coming out. But, yeah. um, Excellent. And so in terms of your, um, what are the things you're most proud of, I suppose, in your life? I always ask my guests this. So what's your, the thing you're most proud of professionally and then also personally as well? Um, yeah, look, on the professional side, I mean, there's, there's been some, um, some successes. I mean, I was an uh, early um, employee of um, Bankers Trust in the mid 80s when we set up in New Zealand um, that became a very, very successful um very much focused on what it could do in New Zealand despite mm -hmm. pressures from a whole lot of people to do other things um but if I look back it's it probably is and I read the other day that you know Rocket Lab's looking to hire another 150 people they're at 1500 wow. so a lot of my professional satisfaction is actually around the success of of clients mm -hmm. um, and as I said I mean this week hopefully touch wood um, I've got a client that will raise less than 500000 in bank funding, but that's a huge success. They've gone from, you know, trying to develop technology, scraping um, around to, to keep in business. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, suddenly they can raise $500,000 from a bank. So they've, yeah. they've grown up. Um, <laughs> 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 and um, but but with huge growth potential. So but they've finally got themselves sorted. So, yeah, a lot of. A lot of professional satisfaction is around the achievements of clients. Mm -hmm. um, on the personal side, that's interesting. Um, today's my 24th wedding anniversary. Oh, yay. Um, which, when we booked in, I was, <laughs> I sort of forgotten that bit. Oh, um, no. Are you in trouble? <laughs> um, well, we, my wife and I are both equally in trouble because um, she also does a lot of consulting and stuff. And so between us, we always end up with one of us having clients that have got issues on Um so yeah, twenty four years married, late starter on that. Two great kids. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that's probably the, on the personal sides, the the greatest. Um. And the in the last twelve months, lost thirty, well, lost forty kgs and put about 10, 10 of them back on. So <laughs> that's uh, still a massive achievement. So post yeah. post Christmas, we'll try and lose the lose the final ten. Oh, that's awesome. Um, out of interest, how did you do that? What was the, what was the reason for wanting to, and then how did you actually stick to it? Um. 
the re I suppose the reason I just looked at myself one um probably yeah it was probably two years ago and it was really in the last year that it's um and just to put on too much yep. weight and um started doing the same stuff that I'd always done which was cut back alcohol eat better more exercise um and I've done that time and time again I um the thing that I did differently this time was I started doing meditation ah. um, and I've stopped doing that as regularly as I should. And that's why the weight's going back on. So, so we'll start doing that again. And I think that just tears the mind yep. um, and, and helps to sort of focus, de-stress. Mm -hmm. um, so I say bre breathing is like actually really, really important in weight loss. And, yeah. and often when you meditate, it's the only time that you're actually paying attention to your breathing. Yeah, look, and I think it is. So, you know, as I say, I've, I've done it, tried to do it probably since I was, you know, university and beyond. And um, and this this time it's largely worked. Yep. And I've got to get back into meditation to lose the, the final 10 gauges. So... But still, great, um, great result. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay, so we're talking about creating freedom today, right? Because that's one of your passions, as is mine. Tell me a little bit about what, what you mean by that. What does freedom mean to you? <laughs> um, I suppose for me personally, it's, um, and, and it was an interesting comment when I first met, met my wife, and I was a finance person, and she was sort of in the communications, and um, and I <laughs> talked opposite about... Opposite attract, is that right? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, a bit of that. Um, I talked about having money, but not from a point of view of wealth, but from the ability that that gives you the choice to do things. Mm. So for me, creating freedom is creating, you know, uh, an environment where you can actually have choices, where you have options. Mm. And so probably using a finance term, you have the option around doing something. So you can make decisions without having to go, can I afford it? And, mm. and, and working with, you know, a lot of early stage companies, cash is always the, the issue. Yep. So you sort of sit there and go, should we do this? They go, we'd love to, but how do we fund it or how do we finance it? Or, you know, so so for me, creating freedom is, is around having an environment where you've got choices. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that might be personal choices, that might be financial choices, that might be anything. So, um, and, and obviously what, freedom means for every individual is totally different so yeah that's one of the things um so I recently joined the cfo center mm -hmm. which is a um, global um firm of corporate cfos who have decided to sort of work in the sme space yeah and that's one of the key things that they focus on is what do the owners actually want from the business and they talk about the numbers that matter. And we're not talking sales or profit. We're going, what is it that really matters? So it could be for an owner that they want to work three days a week. Yep. So you're sitting there going, you're probably working seven. How do we create a business environment that allows you to get to working three days a week? Or, um, you know, client testimonials. One said that the number that mattered to this person was two. And it was the number of birthdays that she'd missed with her kids because she was busy. So, of course, right. that was the motivation was how do I make sure that I'm not missing birthdays because I'm having to work. So, mm -hmm. no, that's fair enough. And so CFO, the CFO Centre, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because you're not necessarily a full time CFO for these companies. You are uh, what I would call a fractional CFO, which means you're doing a, a, a period of time with each company that you work with. How does that work? Um yeah, look, it's it's um, it's exactly that. So it is not a permanent mm -hmm. um, role. Um, um, we call them part-time CFOs. And yep. interesting in induction that was discussed, but this was sort of a company set up 21 years ago where fractionalised roles didn't, didn't exist. exist so, yeah. so they have created. And to be it. fair, it's still it's still reasonably new in New Zealand. I think. I mean, in America, we talk about it a lot, right? So we talk about fractional integrators, fractional CFOs, fractional. You know, we, we we understand that you don't actually need the old model of having somebody full time in a role for those higher, more specialised roles. You're actually better to have somebody who is super skilled in that area and an expert in that area, but working for a shorter period of time. Yeah. So so the, the and that's exactly it. So this uh, these are probably. I'm the exception, but but most of them have come out of larger corporates, so they've got that discipline. They are CFOs, and they're not. It's not an accountant that's trying to to take that next step. So our focus is very much at that very 
strategic end of the business. Yep. I ever seen getting the, the the base right, but very much focused at the top end. So for a lot of companies, um, they don't need somebody doing that role full time. Yep. Um, so they might be still growing um, and they need somebody to fill that role, whether it's one day a week, two days a week, whatever it is, just somebody who'll come in and have that that oversight. Yep. Um, it might be that over time that role grows. Um, and in fact, part of our success would be that we do ourselves out of a job because right. you get to a point where they sit there and go, we've grown big enough, we actually need somebody full time to be filling this role. And then we would step out of the business and bring somebody in to do that mm. um, full time. So and it I, is that, sorry, it yeah. is that level of, it is that level of, next level of expertise and 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 um, capability yeah i was going to say my experience working with mid-sized businesses is often that they they'll have a full-time i'm going to say accounts person but they're trying to be a bookkeeper an accountant a financial management accountant and nobody can be all of that right they're, they're, they're quite specialized roles and if you've got somebody who is particularly good at sort of bookkeeping the lower end of stuff they're probably not strategic in the way that they actually think and the way they manage finances yeah. so bringing in a cfo or fractional cfo gives you the ability to tap into that expertise um, around the strategic financial decision making rather than the day-to-day bookkeeping and accounts is that fair yeah look i think that's um each client's going to have a slightly different requirement um yep. and um so yeah look the first client i've got's got exactly that they've got their own finance team yep. um and they outsource to they use a big top tier a uh, top six accounting firm for tax and doing a lot of that stuff mm-hmm. And it's just that it's um, it's rapidly growing, so the issue becomes around how do we f- fund this? They've got um, some smart IP they've developed, so the question becomes how do we actually commercialise that outside of our current market? So, so there's lots of you know quite strong strategic issues that that need to be brought in. So, um, and that's where it is. I mean, one of one of the guys we that works with us. Um, you know, they found themselves actually doing the accounting because for a period they the firm had the accountant had gone, they said we'll do this, but this is not where we really want to spend our time. So right, was, value. But you just yeah. added a transition. You gave made sure that work was being done while they found the right person to replace that or, no, or move in there. Good idea, absolutely. Okay, so what are the um what are the reasons somebody might consider bringing somebody in externally? Um It, it again, it will vary. I mean, uh, it's interesting. I think uh, both locally and and around the world, quite often there'll be a problem. They'll hit a cash flow issue, or um, and we're about to face it. The bank will start to ask them questions, and and they want somebody sort of to come in with a higher skill base and an external view. Yeah. Um, or they're sitting there and they are growing, and they go, and we just need to accept. Um, or you've got a founder who's decided that they may want to transition out of the business. And so they're sort of sitting there going, we've got three years, we're wanting to exit. And then you go through the whole, you've got to get everything into shape. You want to make sure this is presented properly and you want to work through that sort of plan. Mm -hmm. Um, I think probably a lot of times it will be crisis or problem led. Yep. Um, And then we would go in, we'd try and sort out how we fix that problem. We'd make sure the, the, the foundations are in place. And then through that relationship, hopefully then start to build the, how can we help you in a sort of longer term basis to really focus on those, those areas that matter. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and I suppose others, um, you know, we, others that we'll, we'll see as they grow, they just need some additional resources so you might have investors who go look we need somebody in here who can provide that strategy but we don't need to be paying somebody full time yep um yeah okay and what are some of the biggest pitfalls um or the biggest challenges that you see um clients have that they you know come to you with um I, I, yeah, I, where I'm at, and I think we're most. It, it, it will come around cash flow and yep. funding, and um, um, because that's the one that really gets people to. You know, suddenly when you're sitting there going, "I can't make payroll," <laughs> mm-hmm. you go, "I've got an issue," and it's actually really surprising. Um, and what 
what a lot of people don't realize is that actually very successful companies that are growing very quickly will often run into cash flow problems. Yes. Because, you know, you've you've got more working capital, so you've got more stock, you've got greater debtors, you've got <laughs> Um, more assets deployed and stuff. So, yeah. So, cash flow isn't necessarily a negative thing, and it isn't necessarily that the company hasn't been run well. It actually can be a, a side effect of massive growth. Yes, and and of course, what we what we've got happening now in the economy is obviously um, COVID um, creates a whole lot of issues. But you know, we're talking about recessions. We're talking about um, there's no doubt that some of the banks are tightening what they're lending. Um, mm -hmm. You know, for a lot of SMEs, the banks will be looking at, you know, the house or the mortgage and, and all of those sorts of things to fund. So so cash flow is going to become a, a problem mm -hmm. um, for a lot of businesses. Um, and actually, if we go back and, you know, we, you know, I'm old enough to have lived through a number of cycles, but, <laughs> but for a lot of um, companies, you know, the last real heavy recession was probably 2008. Yep. Um, and so you've got a lot of people, not just the entrepreneurs, but you've also actually got a lot of the financing. So the bank, people making credit decisions in banks or investors, the venture capital firms, or they've not lived through that. And all they've lived through is a, is a period of Growth. boom yep. <laughs> um, and lending into a booming market's easy. Yep. Um, so there, there has to be some issues around... Um, yeah, with what we've got is just not only how your business reacts, but how the banks mm. react. So, um, uh, and as so there'll be some tightening of purse strings, there'll be some decisions that they make around who they will and won't lend to. Yes. Do you think, I mean, I don't know, I also lived through a few, a few couple of recessions myself, but I mean, in terms of the, the, the supposed upcoming recession, do you think that there will be um, some banks who will actually start pulling things back and saying, we, we want that repaid or why do, where do you think it's going to head? Um, well, I think I think there's no doubt that some of the banks have um, pulled back, as the, the the party that we've just got funded through one of the banks. I mean, they've actually said that they had done deals earlier in the year that probably now they wouldn't be doing. Um, so that affects the new stuff. Yeah. Yep. So that pulls back. Um, I'd be very surprised. I'd be very surprised if the banks here um, in New Zealand actually start to ask for. Um, or, or start to pull money back um, because they they understand that that causes a problem. What yep. we will see is the bank will go if 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 a company turns up and says, "Look, we need another fifty thousand on our overdraft," they might sit there and go, "Well, we're not prepared to do that, yep. and we want somebody to come in and have a a decent look at what's going on." Yeah, um, and and that's probably where ideally, if you're in that or you think you're in that situation, having somebody on board before you go and talk to the bank. So you can sit there and go, look, we need 50,000, but here's the steps we're taking to free up cash and get get the business sustainable or to, or to just present it yeah. as a very sustainable business. Um, that's probably be, better being done ahead of talking to the banks yep. um, rather than talking to the bank and the bank then saying, well, actually, we want you to to, to go and do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. And it's, it's, it's kind of true, isn't it? You've always got to be thinking about these things way before you actually need them because if you leave it till the last minute, um, then you're going to run into some issues. So in general terms, I mean, let's just say uh, business is listening in, they're going, hey, look, we know we're going to see some potential cash flow issues coming up in the next six months. When would you suggest is the best time to actually start thinking about um, you know, getting things ready for a bank. <laughs> Is it more than six, six months? Six months ago. <laughs> okay, uh, good. Yeah. No, look. The sooner you start to it, the sooner you start to address it. The and back to the sort of freedom. The more options you give yeah. yourself, the more ability you have to have a look at different ways of funding it. To you know, if you're talking to the bank, you go, look, we're going to put in place some strategies. This is you know, what actions can we take? Yep. So are there some things that we can go, hey, we can do a couple of months of X, mm -hmm. which hopefully will show that it's working. Yep. So when we go to the bank, we go, look, two months ago, we implemented this strategy and we've seen some improvements. So, you know, we can project that forward mm -hmm. to say this is what it's going to look like going forward as opposed to this is what it looked like historically. Yeah, um, yeah it's all of those things. It's looking at different funding options. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of, and that's, that's probably, um, and I'll defend the banks 
to a degree. I've been approached by a lot of companies who go, we've talked to the banks and they won't lend us money. And you go, well, actually, it's not their job to lend you money where you are. You're, you know, by talking to the banks, you're talking to the wrong person. Yep. So this is no different to, you know, marketing. <laughs> if you're a small SME selling, um, you know, uh, widgets to small customers. Yeah. You know, you know that if you're going to go and knock on, um, you know, Fonterra's door, they're likely to say no thanks. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to identify who your target market is. So when you're raising debt or equity, you are in the business of business to business selling, but your product is your company, mm -hmm. not your product. Yep. So it's one of those things. Identify who the likely investors Pictures. are, yep. who the right investors are, and spend your time you know, talking to them and present in the way that they would understand. Yep. Um, so a lot of times can be spent chasing the impossible. wrong investor. Yeah. And, and, and yes, you're, you're right. It's impossible. They're yep. not, they're not going to invest. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so you can waste a lot of time. So it's a really interesting one, isn't it? Because I mean, people always naturally fall to the bank. I mean, that's the, the obvious choice, but there are many, many different options out there, depending on what you're trying to do. You know, you've got venture capitalists, you've got um, potentially early stage angel investors, you've got um, second tier lending firms. Like what are the other options out there? Um, Asset finance? Yeah, yeah, look, you've got asset financing, you've got data financing, um, you've got um, the ability to lease as opposed to, to buying assets. Mm -hmm. um, you can look at, you know, one of the options if you if you really are is, is looking at better terms with your customers, get them to pay sooner, mm. um, try and stretch out your creditors, pay them on longer terms. Um, yeah, angel investing, venture capital, um, private equity. There's, there's there's lots of options. I mean, the challenge for the the challenge for true sort of SMEs yep. are those that there aren't a lot of options. No. <laughs> um, and if we look at and a lot of people will talk about venture capital, but if you're talking pure venture capital, they invest in absolute game changers. Yep. So if you aren't, and that's You've got to have runs on the board. You've got to be show that you're a sustainable business and that you have the ability to 10, 10x pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, and, and that's their business model. Now, yeah. the angel network's slightly different. Um, there's also sort of family offices and there are other investors around. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's not it's not easy. Um, I, I was sort of thinking that, um, you know, prior to, um, you know, so when, when I worked for the bank, we advised the company on buying, doing the management buyout. Um, and they did some really interesting things. Once they owned the company, the the cars got leased. Yep. They were big enough that their couple of their core suppliers, they were able to say, well, you know, deliver this stuff to our warehouse, but we'll tell you when we've used it. Okay. And then we'll pay you 30 days after we've used it. Hmm. So that freed up a lot of, they had a lot of stock. Yep. Um, but they were big enough that the suppliers suddenly went, well, you know, if these guys walk away from us, we're in a bit of trouble. Mm -hmm. um, and very quickly freed up quite a lot of of capital. I mean, it was interesting. When we bought it, we were, of course, telling the um, offshore owners that we had to replace a piece of machinery because it wasn't fully functioning. Reality was that um, it was a printer, yep. and it was a six-color printer, and it was only printing five colors. <laughs> so we said, it'll have to be replaced. So, of course, that got factored into the purchase price. Reality was they never printed more than four colors on it. So, <laughs> so, um, yeah. so, so there are ways to to free up cash. Um, yep. A lot of it could be just collecting debtors faster. Um, you know, stretching credit terms. Yep. Excuse my dog. That's the dogs. Yeah, <laughs> That's sorry. the dogs. Yeah, they're always joining in. Somebody's coming that I didn't like. That's all good. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So I think. It comes back to the, the, I think this is what we talked about before the podcast, it's like actually it's about being really clear on what your plan is, isn't it? And knowing what you've got coming up in the future and yeah. being prepared for that so you can then start to look for uh, the, the things that will help you to achieve that vision that you've got. Yeah, yeah. look, it's, it's um, and it's interesting, we're going to the, the CFO centre and then uh, aligned, when we sat down and I went through EOS with you, I sat there and thought, this, Perfect. The, these <laughs> yeah. are a, there's an overlap, but most of it's a, a fit. Um, trying to change when you're in crisis, you, you get into crisis mode yeah. and then you do stuff to survive. Mm -hmm. um, 
obviously from my point of view as a as a founder of a business or an owner of the business um it's the big picture stuff is what do you want out of a business mm -hmm. and then starting to understand um what that is and it's as i've said before it's not necessarily purely financial it's about personal ambitions and and, and bits and pieces and what's driving you yeah and and for most really successful entrepreneurs it's not about money per se yeah for smaller businesses it might just be the freedom to be your own boss or whatever so understanding what that is and then setting in place um a view of how we want to be in, you know, is it five years time or ten years time? What whatever you say, it yeah. is, yeah. And then starting to understand how can I build towards that, and how can I build resilience into the business so that when stuff happens, mm -hmm. and stuff always happens, the times <laughs> I get told, you know, oh, you know, this is a once in a hundred year, you know, event. I go, well, I started in v I started in this early stage, probably two thousand, so yeah. pre the dot com crash. So I've done dot com. I've done SARS. Yep. I've done nine eleven. Yeah. I've done the GFC, COVID, COVID. and and there'll actually, be something else. A few other. Yeah. Asia, there was an Asian financial crisis oh, in course, Eastern yeah. Europe. So so almost there is always a crisis yeah. somewhere going on. Um, it may not affect your business, but it's going to be affecting somebody. So um, building that resilience in mm -hmm. um, again, so it gives you options yeah. to to be able to say when you get to a point. Actually, I've got choice here. Mm -hmm. I scale back and just bunker down yep. and get through it. Or actually, I get proactive and actually go after bigger market share because others in, that I'm competing with are probably struggling. Yep. You know, so all of those sorts of I things. I think it's something I always I say this, you know, when we're about to go into a potential recession, it's actually a great opportunity. Um, because if you've actually got all your ducks in a row and you're really clear about what your vision is and you're really clear about who you're targeting and what you're offering, uh, there is an opportunity to actually really gain market share because a lot of people don't have those plans. And so you've got you've got a one up advantage against them. Look, it's it's and and now that's a really interesting point because I I um I joined um I'll say I'll call it D B group um in early 1990s as their treasurer yep. and um it wasn't called that back then um <laughs> and we had some interesting challenges um but it was interesting because we started to raise funds and um so i of course went to a number of the banks and the bnz turned up and my boss sat there and said uh, almost uh, we're, i'm sitting there going we try to raise money and he sat there and says where have you been for the last five years you know we're a client of yours and yet you've had your head buried in trying to deal with all of the 1987 stock market crash and all the bits and pieces. And you suddenly realized that, that here he was going, he was a good customer. Yep. And the bank got diverted to looking after the bad stuff. Yeah. <laughs> they ignored him. Yep. So the same thing happens is in, in a recession, you might have competitors who have got really good customers, but all their focus shifts to other parts of their business mm -hmm. there's an opportunity to walk into that that customer and say well look we're still here we're here to talk to you you know if you're unhappy yeah, if you're <laughs> unhappy let's let's talk about change so yeah. you you are right yeah i also think it's a real opportunity i mean people kind of say we're going to cut back on on things like sales and marketing it's probably the best time to be investing in sales and marketing and i'm sure your wife would agree it's like getting that communications stronger in that time you're actually in a less crowded market i mean i don't know if you notice this on a, a personal level you know when, when we had covid the amount of people who suddenly jumped onto linkedin and social media that had never been there before um but they will start to pull out again as they go through a recession potentially so if you can be consistent it's a great opportunity look it, it's and that's a, again the the CFO center. Um, it's an it's an interesting discussion because they did a lot of online activity pre COVID. So mm -hmm. a lot of their sales marketing was you know LinkedIn messages and, and and bits and pieces. But you're absolutely right. As soon as COVID happened, as soon as people started looking at, you ended up with a whole lot of other people oh. marketing in that space, and mm -hmm. it got noisy, really noisy. Um, yeah, and and you know sales sales leads. Um, probably telling stories out of school, but sales, <laughs> the, you know, the, yeah. the channel's changed yep. and they're, they're spending and we're spending time looking at what are alternative um, ways of, of building that sales channel. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that, there are opportunities. And, and, yes, probably putting more money into sales and marketing now um, going into the recession, if you can afford it, yeah. um, is probably a good thing because – 
people will be looking around, people will be frustrated or they'll get concerned about a supplier or what have you. So mm. um, uh, people normally don't like changing unless something causes a change. People don't go actively out there changing banks or no. changing phone companies. We actually, we're, we're quite complacent. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when there is a disruption, mm -hmm. there will be a bunch of people out there for whatever reason will start to actually look around when historically they probably wouldn't. Yeah. So. Yeah, no real opportunities. Okay, of course, there's so much we could talk about. I think, but we're, but we're already um, we're already kind of about thirty minutes, which is which is time flies, hey. Um, top three tips. What would be your top three tips for people listening in today around creating freedom? Um, yeah, look, I I go back to um, if you can get some headspace, start to really think about what it is you want out of the out of the business and over what sort of time frame. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of founders don't, and and um, so it's it's really, you know, what do you want what, over what time frame? Yeah, the, and I think yeah. that goes by one of my favourite sayings. It's like if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. So having that clarity, even in the long term, if you don't, you're not quite sure how you're going to get there, but that's your clear vision, you're more likely to actually achieve that. Yes, yeah, and um, um. Interesting. I, I I was listening to a um, person working in venture capital, and and she actually said, "You'll, you know, and this is for the really high growth, uh, really ambitious um, companies. You'll probably have a a goal that you actually will never achieve, but you've got to sit there and go, I'm changing the world. Yeah. And then you then you work out what the next sort of steps are. So you break it break it down. But but clearly understanding what you, your family, and others. Um, and if you've got multiple shareholders, mm -hmm. trying to make sure that you're sort of aligned yep. on what people want out of it, or at least understand that, you know, Jane wants to stay in the business for 15 years and you only want to be there five. So can we build a plan around how we can transition? Mm -hmm. um, so understand that. Next thing I think that a lot of people fail is understanding where you actually are. So I mm. listen to, and this goes for large organizations, this goes for governments. They all talk about this great vision and then they go, oh, look, and it's just over there and we're here and we're doing great. So we just have to do a little bit. Honest assessment of where you actually are and what your capabilities are. Mm -hmm. Then once you understand that where you are and where you want to get to, you can build a pathway to say, okay, how do we start with steps? And I'd go, if it's a five-year vision, you know, where do we want to be in three? Yep. Where do we want to be in one? Yeah. Where do we want to be in 90, 90 days? days? And yeah. it's all of, <laughs> all of the stuff that you talk about, which is break it down into little pieces. Mm -hmm. Um well, and we always say, now start with the end in mind. It's Stephen Covey, right? Yes. Um, start with the end in mind. This is where you're headed and then start to work backwards until you get it down to bite-sized chunks. Yes. Because otherwise we get overwhelmed. This huge vision, yeah. for most people, it's like, I've got no idea how we're going to do that. Don't worry about that. That's where we're headed. What does it look like in five years, three years, yeah. one year, and then 90 days? Yeah. And only focus on the most important yeah. things in the next 90 days. Well, yes, getting the getting the right resources and, and different so different people might focus on different parts of that yep. that pathway, but um, yeah, I I was lucky enough. I I um, was at a lecture which was given by a retired four star U.S. general, <laughs> and he talked about transforming the U.S. military, and his argument was every the first battle of every war that the U.S. entered into, they got their um, backsides kicked. They were never prepared. And see, it is said until the first Kuwait Gulf War when they basically sorted that in in in, in one go. Yep. And um, he always talked about transformation being exactly what we're talking about: is find some wins, mm. find some little stuff that you can go, "Oh, we achieved this." Yep. Because even though that may not get you miles down the track, it gets people going, "Oh, we can make a change. We can get something successful." So it's. Yep. So even if it builds it, momentum, right? You're taking a step forward, even though you might take a couple back, you're still moving forward as opposed yeah. to taking on something really huge, yeah. kind of failing at it and then going, oh, we can't do yes. this. Yeah. And, and and to build confidence with your team and the people around you. So earlier I sort of said, look, you know, if you're going to raise money, let's think through and let's take a couple of steps so that we can show the bank, look, we've made this change. This is what's happening. Mm -hmm. Early in those stages, pick some easy ones. Pick yep. some stuff you know you're going to win. 
because all it does is give people confidence. confidence yeah. If you start failing all along, then the bigger vision go people challenge. Mm -hmm. So no, I love it. Okay, that's great. Hey, look, um, if people want to find out more about this and, and specifically talk to you around their creating freedom financially and otherwise, how do they get hold of you, Ralph? Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Yep. So um, Ralph Shale. Ralph yep. Shale. Um, I think there's only one of me. <laughs> that's um, good. And um, um, or. Uh, the CFO Centre in New Zealand has a landing page if you want to talk to the CFO Centre. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Excellent. And just a little bit about, you know, so in terms of the process when you work with a client, what does that look like? So somebody's been listening to this and go, oh, I want to have a chat to Ralph. What usually happens? Um, first thing would be exactly that is just let's sit down, have a chat about it, um, coffee for an hour or so yep. get to know each other talk about what the issues are trying to understand where to go um the cfo center really interestingly has a whole lot of questions and answers and it has assessments to do so part of that process is is almost pulling back and looking at we have a 12 box yep. looking at each of those boxes and then trying to identify two or three that really need some attention mm -hmm. um it's getting to know people um yep. I mean, I have an attitude, I, I approach that I'll happily sit down with anyone for half an hour, an hour. If they want to pick my brains about what their options are around funding, I'm, then I'm happy to have that conversation. I'm happy to say, look, I think you can go and talk to these three people. Yeah. And if you want an introduction, I'll do an intro. But um, yeah, that's, that's always, because it, a lot of the times it's not till, you know, two years down the track when they suddenly go, actually, what Ralph said was yeah. <laughs> really important. Let's, let's chat. So Yeah, fantastic. Okay, that's great. So Ralph Shell on LinkedIn or the CFO Centre in New Zealand. Ralph's happy to have a chat with you about your different options and things. Yep. Um, have a coffee, catch up. Um, sounds great. Thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you for coming no, in. That's right. I hope you're not in too much trouble with your wife. <laughs> no. And <laughs> no, no. we'll get you some chocolate steak. We're probably e equally, um, equally responsible for this one. <laughs> Fair enough. We've still got the rest of the day to sort out. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll leave you to the rest of the day. Thank you for your time. I um, look forward to catching you again soon.